Hello everyone, I am Eloy Leafar here again. Probably you uh, recognize me for this very complicated accent that I have. I know. Uh, probably the video will have some subtitles. If you understand the subtitles, thanks internet. If you don't understand anything that says here, sorry, it's not with me. It's the internet, it's not with me. I'm doing my best, I promise. Or I think I'm trying to do my best. Uh, thanks and welcome here again. I really appreciate the, uh, this opportunity. I meet this amazing, magical, really marvelous person. Uh, very long time ago, like months, like not weeks, like months. Uh, he's a very friendly person. He don't think on that, but he's a very friendly person. He's very sweet and very kind. He looks like a rock star, but he's an incredible person with a hair made of pure gold. Uh, he's awesome. He has beautiful eyes also, and he's pretty, pretty smart. I had the opportunity to read his book uh, before the book comes out. That is How Witchcraft Saved My Life. Uh, from the first chapter, I really love the book. I really love the kindness. I really love the honesty, the sincerity, the process, the progress, every word in there was marvelous. I just immersed myself in the whole story. Uh, I really love the book. It's in this world, we have many books on witchcraft and we have this book. It's essential that you have it in your collection, in your library, in your life. It's a blow mind world, life-changing book. I really appreciate if you have the opportunity to read it, and I really more appreciate if you have the opportunity to share it with reviews or something else. Uh, my friend here next to me, uh, who will totally e make an eclipse here with his presence, is Vincent. Vincent, uh, everybody know him like Vinny, uh, is an author, a witch. I think he's a very good psychic. Uh, you probably know him because he has been on the podcast around because everybody loves him. And he has this amazing book and he's also collaborating with the amazing platform of Witch With Me and Witch With Books, where he has a very good position in there. He's helping everybody. He's raising voices. He's doing a lot of work. It's incredible the level of work that this guy is doing in such small time that he has here with us. So uh, please say welcome here to my amazing friend, Vincent. How are you doing? I'm doing well, how are you? Great, great. I'm very happy that you are here. I love to have you here. You know that I am stalking you from the day one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Because the best friends stalk you in life. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't be your friend if I don't know what is happening with your life. And it's right. every day, every hour, you know that. And I was looking any excuse to have you here, to have a conversation. So I, I think, oh, if I make this video show, I can invite him. So I have a perfect excuse to speak with my friend. It would be very nice. So the whole reason you made the show is yes. to, yeah, that makes sense yes. to me. Perfect. Everything around you, because people love you. Right. <laughs> Vincent, uh, first of all, where you born? In which city? Um, I was born outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in um, a town called Abington. Uh, that's it. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> Nothing special. Got it. Don't worry. I born in Amazon. When people ask me about how it is, it's just goods. It's just goods and some rivers in there. I mean, what do you expect? Uh, now, where are you living? I live in South Carolina now, in uh, the upstate, kind of in the uh, Blue Ridge foothills. Okay, Vincent, because I am the stranger here, I am the outsider, the outcast, I, I am the immigrant, I don't know the country. Which is your favorite thing about your city? About my city? Well, so yes. I, don't, I don't technically live in a city. I live in, I guess you would call it a town. Um, it's very small. Our main street has like 20 shops on it. And um, there's lots of sprawling country and rolling hills. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so um, we, we are live... here once here and we love you anyway. Cool. Um, we live in the Blue Ridge Mountain foothills. So it's like rolling, rolling kind of hills that go into mountains really fast. And you can see a whole mountain line 
right in the distance on most like good days. Um, and that's the Smoky Mountains that we're right at. And then uh, it's just all very green right now. But even in the winter, because it's South Carolina, there's still a lot of greenery. That's probably the best thing about where I live. That's really nice. Th thank thanks for all the view that you give us. Uh, I meet you for this amazing book that you wrote. Um, after the book, I could just lost contact with you. Ah, he made a, a nice book. I read it so nice. But I decided to keep you very close because I really adore you. Uh, you make How Witchcraft Save My Life. It's a very personal book. It's, I think that is essential. Uh, in, in many years of practice, I read many books. I find many books, and this book is entirely different to anything else. I really love it. And when I say I really love it, it's because I really love it. And I say this, I this, I mention this all the time in social media because we don't have many books like this one where, where the person, the witch, is telling you the story of how he finds the witchcraft and how witchcraft saved him and empowered him in many ways. Uh, how was the process for you? Because in the book, you give us your story. Uh, but how was for you to sit down to write all of this idea? Be, be, because it's a very crazy idea of the conception of the book. So, I mean, to sit down and write the book, it was, it was not as hard as I thought it would be. But honestly, like, I didn't really just sit down and write the book. I, um, I wrote the book in like stolen moments. I wrote it on my phone in my car between the gym and, and starting work that day or I wrote it like when I was unemployed for a minute and had no idea what I was going to do and I'd spent every day writing complete fodder like everything I wrote was probably not used during that time but um like I'd just sit out in the parking garage at work on my lunch break or before I went in and I'd, I'd be writing and so the process of writing was very um fluid because it I mean, I could just do it when I needed to do it or when I was like kind of driven to do it, you know? And then I started this pretty cool job where I could like use my computer on downtime to also write on the book. So I started doing that. And so it was just kind of this like all day sort of process that I sat with. And once I really saw the direction that the book was going in, it, it really flowed out of me. I mean, I would say that a large part of, the book is is like very channeled um as if as, as like so I've heard people read out loud parts of the book and I'm like wait I wrote that like I don't even remember like saying that you know what I mean and of course I don't reread my book every day or anything I have all these other books I'm reading so like I don't I don't fully I guess like recall everything but when I hear it I'm like well that sounds like me but did I really say that and so I think that there was a lot of channeling happening there, but then in terms of writing the memoir type stuff, that was very easy. It, it was harder to decide what to leave out and what to not bring up because I really believe in being able to deliver the message of you are not alone. And so being able to say, hey, this is where I came from and this is how I got to where I'm at, um, is almost like, I mean, my, my duty as an incarnate human. And I feel as though anything less than being perfectly honest and upfront and open and um, transparent about who I am and my life, um, it would be folly. It would be, it would be for, for, if I, if I wasn't able to stand up and do that, then I'm not living true to who I really am because that's who I am. This person that's like, okay, but I can accept my mistakes. I can call out and say, yeah, this is where I fucked up. And I can stand up and I can say, okay, this is how I'm going to make that better. This is how I'm going to heal. This is how I'm going to, you know, move forward, always moving forward. And I think it's important for everyone to know that somebody who, exist in that way can also have these really down moments where 
like I'm trying to kill myself or I'm super depressed and I need a therapist or, you know, I'm struggling to make money. And I think that that's humanizing for most people and that we almost lack this statement in the witchcraft world or the community where we're like, hey, it's okay. You don't need anything. And I know that there's lots of people that outwardly say it, right? But it's all so much do this, do this, do this in a lot of witchcraft books as opposed to this happened and I learned this from that. You know what I mean? And I just feel like there needed to be more of that. So the whole writing process and involving my life in it really made sense from that angle. Yes. Uh, when I, I remember in the first moment that I received the manuscript, I am Capricorn. Uh, uh, I am very judgy with everything. And every time, I am most of the time saying sorry for the things that I say, because I'm Capricorn. When something, when something is blue, I'm just like, why is blue? Why need to be blue? I am that kind of person. Uh, when I sit down to read your book, I mean, the title was, okay, it's a very interesting title, but what, I mean, it's, it's a novel. I don't understand. It's a book on, on spells. Uh, yeah, the first chapters are very grounding, are very go to reality. Uh, but, but you don't lose interest after that. You continue reading and the book is going more and more deep. And at the same time, you go, you can see, we can see your evolution in the process, how, the mistakes that you made, how do you admit that you made the mistake, but also how you process that information, how you evolve from that situation, how you come out of that place. Uh, feels, yeah, feels dark for many times, but always in the end you find the light in the, in the path. And it's guiding you to the reader in all the story, and that's magnificent. Uh, I really love it because when you have, I, I said this before, uh, I'm taking the spotlight here, but when you have so many years of practice and you read so many books that are always the same and the same and the same and love spells, money spells, and most of the, of the same things over and over, not trying to disqualify any author, but most of the time it's just the same stuff. Uh, and you find someone who really says, you know, I, I am tr practicing this and this is how this really works and uh, this is how this is all for me. Is the whole reality, the true story that everybody is looking for. The clients of the witches, the people who go to the store, the people who buy these books are living this life, but they are just conforming themselves many times with the book that just say, oh, you need to make this spell and your life will be better in that way. That happens. And your book was, I, I think, to be honest with you, I think that I read it uh, two or three times because I remember that the first time that I read it, when I was in the half of the book, I was like, okay, I need to process all of this. So I just, I love it. I couldn't help it. <laughs> I love it so much. It's so he cute. Cuddle. It's so cute. Uh, when I was in the half of the book, I remember that I was like, okay, uh, I need to process all of this information. So I just started the book again from, from the first page. And it was like, wow, this guy is this guy is a warrior. I mean, I know, I'm usually, you know, oh, please, I am an immigrant. Nobody's harder than me. But when I read the job, it was like, wow, this is a very deep book. This is a very deep history that I'm entirely sure that if I were in your shoes, probably I never find that the strength that you find and the solutions and the light that you find because you are an amazing person. And I let me repeat this. I really love the book. I think that is one of the best books in the last, I don't know, 10 years, 20 years. It's a book that everybody needs to read at least one time in their life because it's not just a typical book on spell casting. It's a book about the life of a real witch. And that's very interesting. <coughs> How? Well, that's like what I wanted out of it. I wanted to be able to, to show, like originally it was all very, I want to write this book about the life of being a witch, you know, and like how I got here. And then the editors, you know, like the, the publishing company has their opinion of what that should look like too. And so you find a way to like mesh it well and make it work. You want to provide 
what they need, but while also staying true to what you're doing, right? And so I felt like it was imperative to give that to the world. But then also you said something a moment ago where you, I think you said that you couldn't have um, come out of some of the things that I talk about successfully. And I think that that's not true. I think that anyone can come, anyone could be me. Like that's the whole point is that I'm not unique in these situations that I was able to grow out of them and evolve from them, you know? And I think that everybody has the capacity to do that. And I think that for me, witchcraft taught me that I could do that. Uh, learning witchcraft, understanding the principles of witchcraft, even before ever calling myself a witch and like fully practicing it, um, I was still like gaining empowerment the whole time. And I think that empowerment is really where our magic, our power comes from, you know? And so um, I just, I think that that whole aspect is, is just highly important to recognize, but also to understand that I'm not some special individual because I, I got through it. You know what I mean? Like the whole idea is that anybody could. So I'm, I'm sure that you could too, if it was, you know, your story to tell instead. I don't go to fight with the dance world because the, the dance world was too much perfect. I, I can't. So uh, my next, uh, do um, go around in some way of my next question here. Um, how was, when you finally has the book ready, how was the process for you, not the technical process, how was for you the idea of, I want to make this a big deal, I want to try with a publisher, uh, and this a very big publisher, Slewelling, that has been around like forever. Mm. Uh, how, how was this for you? Uh, I mean, and when they say to you, yes, how was all of this experience? So when I, went to um when I went to pitch my book I didn't I had an idea of what I wanted to pitch but I didn't really know honestly because I was like I'll be damned I'm publishing a book like it's just been a life goal so here's this thing that I've been working towards since I was like an eight-year-old boy right and I finally had this opportunity to sit in front of somebody and have their attention for five minutes and pitch a book. And I did. And then I, I guess it was interesting enough that they were like, here's my email address. And then it moves forward. Right. So like from that moment of, of walking out with an email address to the moment that I turned in my final draft, there was a lot of up and down for me. Like sometimes I really thought that I couldn't do it. Sometimes I was very sure that I, I did not deserve to write a book, you know, because I don't have the years under my belt that so many people seem to have, you know, but then I, I went past that. I pushed through that. I went into the uncomfortable place and what came out was a really good, I mean, like, I'm not going to say it's a really good book, but like it, it, this, this book for beginners who could potentially come from a background like me or not, right. Um, now have access to something that I wish I had when I, was trying to learn or identify if I was a witch or start practice or whatever. And so, I mean, that part of it is very fulfilling, but there's, there's a lot of steps along the way where they're like, Hey, it's not enough this, or Hey, it's too much that. And you really have to take your ego out and put it away. Like, like somewhere you can't see it when it comes to this process, because when uh, when an editor is like hey this isn't good for this reason or that reason but this is great for that reason and this reason like you're not supposed to really focus on either one of those things because they're not coming for you if they're like hey this isn't good and they're not trying to give you a big a big head by telling you hey this is good right they're trying to let you know that this is what they can produce and sell what they can like put it on the market. Right. And so following those guidelines is like, it's not easy. I think, especially for like a first timer, right. Because as a human, we're built to, to 
not always want to be criticized and not always want to be told that we're wrong or that something's not working. And you've really got to step outside of that. And so luckily I went to art school. So I'm really good with criticism and critiques. And if you say something bad about my work, I accept it just as easily and um, patiently and graciously as I would if you said something great about my book. I feel like they're very equal. And the only way that you can get better is by following that, right? So the whole process of, of walking through took like a year. And there were definitely moments where I was like, oh my God, I just turned it in. And it's been two weeks. And like, what if they hated it? And that's why they're not writing me back and things like that, right? Or like, it would be three days and I'd hear from them. I'm like, uh-oh. Like, I wouldn't even read the email and I'd be like, this could be really bad. But then it's like, not. And they're like, all right, great, thanks. And you're like, oh. So like, you just put yourself through stresses that are unnecessary, but they happen anyway. And I think that it's a very humbling experience. And I look forward to doing it a lot in my life. To, uh, to clarify here for all my readers and his readers, the opinions here expressed for my guests are his opinions. If you say something wrong or bad about his book, he will take it very graciously and very nice. If you say something bad about him or his book, I go to use my voodoo dots on you. And I have, <laughs> a, I have a whole room for them. Okay, so passing to the next question. Uh, <laughs> Bini, uh, you are an Ekatean witch. You go with mm -hmm. Ekate. That is mm -hmm. the word of witchcraft. It's one of the most, um, what can I say, interesting. I, I never use the term archetype because I don't believe that gods are archetypes. Uh, but she's all of this blend of so many myths around so many places. I mean, there's so many anthropologists, people trying to figure out her origin, her source from where she comes. And she has so much history, so much myth, lore, and she evolved with the time. That is one of the topics that I love most about the goddess Ekate is that she evolves with history. She don't just stay there like a goddess of love. She, she evolved. She's, she passed for so many histories. And every time that you look for her in a chronological way, you find how the myth evolved and evolved. And now she's very well known in all the magical community, metaphysical community. She's the goddess of related with witchcraft, with the darkness, with the night, with so many things, uh, with everything that is arcane. How do you find her? And how do you think that she, uh, in some way, influenced your life or your work? <coughs> so, I think about this a lot, actually, because when I was a little kid, I was very Catholic. I was really into the Catholic church. I wanted to grow up and become a priest. I was just certain that this is what I wanted to do because it was all so magical. And I was like, oh, I want to be as close to God as I can. Right. And then I, you know, saw the darker side of the whole kind of dogma behind Christianity or really the Abrahamic traditions in general, right? Because all three religions are a little bit whack, like that follow the Abrahamic God. And that's my personal opinion. If a, if a person is following that, I don't mean to be disrespectful by saying they're a little whack. And I'm sorry about that. And I should try harder next time. But um, like to me, the whole aspect was was kind of whack when I was around like 12 I think or 13 um I I really kind of fell from grace and right away there was witchcraft there and and then like for years while I was homeless and going through all kinds of crap there was always like witches present right but I don't recall ever having learned about Hecate or being aware that Hecate was was present for me right um Pretty much from childhood, I was always really attracted to Hermes as a, as a deity. Um, it started with Greek mythologies, and then I just really kind of have idolized so much about Hermes that, I mean, like I have wings tattooed to my ankles that are made out of fire. Um, I used to be homeless and a traveler, so I really felt like I was looked over by him. 
And um, I used to have to steal and hustle in order to survive. So I felt like I was looked out after by him because I never got caught. I've never, never really got caught for the things that I really definitely should have gotten in trouble for. Um, as far as a misspent youth kind of doing what I want to, to survive. But um, I just always felt protected. And then I guess I just kind of stopped paying attention to everything and, and was just like, understanding the universe as a source of all things and that's kind of where I plateaued for almost a decade um on just this idea of you know the energy around us and understanding the universe as a source or like whatever and not really understanding deity or the reason for it but forming my own opinions nonetheless and then as I came into really identifying what I had been doing for so long as witchcraft and deciding to call myself a witch for whatever reason the name Hecate came to me and I don't remember where I read it the first time I don't remember where I heard it but I was doing this whole ritual and like instead of the three deities that I had listed to to call out to for this ritual I only called out to Hecate <laughs> and I was like, that's weird, but okay, I'm going to go with it. Like, cause I just, that's how I work. Like I, I definitely connect to the source and tap in and like let whatever happens happen. Um, because I think that the best things happen in those moments. And um, then it was like a couple days later, um, my sister messaged me and we must have, I must have told her about it after the fact, because I told, I tell my sister about a lot of my spells and um, she's a witch as well. And I must've talked to her about it because it was like two or three days later, after I had finished the ritual, she just sent me a text message one morning. It was just the name Hecate. And I was like, what? And then I kept finding like dead snakes or like weird things that also were like synchronistic with Hecate. And then there was this whole moment on a, um, on a parking garage in like, basically a thunderstorm and tornadoes down here. Um, and like, I just really came into this whole thing with Hecate. And then I started exploring Hecate and witchcraft from there. So like Hecate presented herself to me and I was like, oh, okay, I'm listening. And then like, it became more and more intense. And I was like, oh, let me dive into this rabbit hole. And from there, I feel like that's when that is when I started accessing magic as I understand it today. And that is when I kind of felt this shift between everything that I believed in and understood from being like this big, huge, like source to like a way to tap into the source through Hecate, who has, like you've said, grown over time. And that's because deities, in my opinion, are like egregores. They're these beings that we create through our worship and or our offerings or the attention that we give them like that show American gods or the book. It's actually a book originally, but like these, these deities live because people believe in them. So that's like, that's basically what an egregore is in my head. And so that's what Hecate is, is this, is this access point. That's probably not any different than any deity that you might work with or, like the God that my brother and his wife pray to when they go to church, right? They're all the same. They're all different access points to the same source of power. And it just turns out that un identifying Hecate and understanding Hecate and, and, and seeing her and knowing that she sees me and having this agreement to work together is my best happen. It's, it's the, the fixture that, that fits the tightest, that, that goes on the easiest and, and doesn't let anything out. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but that's how I feel about how I am fascinated it. here. You can continue talking. I am fascinated with all the story, with everything um, that you're saying. This is a whole class that you are giving here. A whole class. No, I mean, maybe one day, but this isn't a class yet. Um, yeah, I just, I don't know. Like, I, I feel like, originally I kind of had a deity looking over me. So sometimes I work with that deity too. And that would be Hermes because there is a special place in my heart for Hermes. And more and more, as I dive deeper into witchcraft and magic and my understanding of everything 
I dive much deeper into Hecate and, you know, some of the darker aspects and like the eater of filth. Like there's this whole aspect of this deity and like its job is to eat filth. And so it makes sense that we would, or not we, because I certainly wasn't alive back then, but like in ancient times, they would leave their like trash and rotten food out for this deity. And I, I, I think that that's fascinating. So like if I have something that's like really on me and I'm trying to get rid of it or, you know, a blockage, like imposter syndrome, for instance, I can offer that to the eater of filth and that's my deity. And she's just this all encompassing multifarious kind of goddess who, I mean, it's just, there's so many uses. There's so many ways to access And so like I live in the mountains and she's the wanderer of the mountains and, you know, she's the lover, like her dogs are, are mentioned as companions and snakes. And I find like dead snakes all the time. It's ridiculous. And I really like to um, adopt them. I've learned to call it adopting. I like to adopt the dead things, but like, I love dead things too. And there's like this whole aspect of the dead to Hecate and, I believe in like owning your rage. And so there's like rage aspects. And I just think that for such, for such a simple connection, right? It's such a large and all encompassing purpose that I can find in her. And sometimes it can be super dynamic and I can use multiple aspects in the same spell to call upon different things to draw it in whatever it is that I'm working toward, you know? And I just, I don't know. I mean, she's clearly the one that wanted to work with me. And I mean, I redevote once a year. So the option is there to not, but I certainly just redevoted and it was really empowering to do it. It was a really nice moment, actually. How do not love you? People, he's married, so I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Vincent, um, I have two questions that I do with uh, to every one of my friends and are the most silly questions ever, but we are talking about me and I am very silly. So uh, the first one is, do you remember which was your first book on magic or witchcraft? So... Um... Well, okay, to be fair, to be completely transparent, the first book of witchcraft that I owned that was mine um, was, I mean, it really isn't even a book of witchcraft. It would be, um, oh no, actually, yeah, I can say the first one that I actually purchased for myself was Weave the Liminal by Lara Tepa Zakrov. And, um, Zarkov. I'm always worried I'm saying her last name wrong. So like I just say she's LTZ. Well, I, she's a great person. I like to say LTZ when I'm talking with people who know who I'm talking about. I'm just like, you know, LTZ. But like, I feel like in these regards, I have to like say the whole name. And I always feel very self-conscious when I say her last name because I say things the way I see it in my head, not the way I read it or hear it. So like in my head, it's Lara Tempa Zakrov, but it could be Zarkov. I'm not sure. Anyway, Weave the Liminal um, is the first time I ever purchased a witchcraft book, but it's not like the first one I ever read. Like when I was 18, my friend owned um, To Write a Silver Broomstick by Silver Ravenwolf, and I devoured that book, but it wasn't mine. I didn't purchase it. It's not like something that I still have. You know what I mean? So yeah. it, it wasn't until recently that I was even able to like be in a position to spend the kind of money that I would need to, to like buy all the books that I want, you know? And, um, and even then I think that I purchased it on audio so that it, cause it was cheaper and I didn't, ha- I didn't, I wasn't doing as well as I am now. Um, not that I'm, you know, doing well or anything, but, um, like I definitely listened to it on, on tape, I guess it was really on my iPhone, but like, uh, that was the first time I purchased it. And I definitely still go back to it sometimes because I think it's a really interesting read or listen. Yes. But. yes, I don't have 
uh, the opportunity to meet her personally. Uh, but she looks like a very gorgeous person. I just talk with her like literally one time in a chat and she was incredibly kind with me. Um, was after an event, she was offering a class on series, marvelous class, like everything related with her. Mm -hmm. And her books are amazing. And actually, I think that I end reading uh, one week ago her new book about the about the witch bodies, the witch body, body of the witch, the witch body, the witch's body. Was great. Was gorgeous. All the I mean the, the analytic that she does uh, avoiding all, all the myths. How she put her mind in there. And she analyzed how the different parts of the body are related with magic and how we use them and how are connected with the elements, uh, the water, the, uh, the blood, the air, uh, lungs, everything is, is, was like, wow, this, this woman has, she has a brain. She's amazing. I agree. I do think that she's amazing. Also, I haven't had that much opportunity to interact with her. I mean, as much as certainly others, but um, I have been fortunate enough to interact with um, LTZ, as we're going to call her for the rest of the time, um, because our books came out on the same day, as well as Jason Menke's. Yes, and I so remember, we. I remember you, 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 uh, all of you made this video uh, together. Yeah, we had our little right. our little yes. book launch party together, and it was really cool. Like, it was really awesome that they were like, "Hey." We want to make you part of this too. Like that's so inviting when it's your first book and you don't really know anyone. And I don't have a following like they do. Like I don't, I, people don't are just finding out who I am, like slow but steady, you know? And so it's not like I had anybody that would have shown up if I was doing it, you know? Um, so it was really nice that they'd invited me and let me be a part of that. And I'm pretty sure I got drunk during that recording because I was like, my book came out. Fuck yeah, I'm drinking champagne. And I think I smoked yeah. a million cigarettes. And um, from that moment, I was like, all right, no more smoking on camera. That's when I decided that wasn't happening anymore. Um, but yeah, like she's super, super kind and easy to talk to. Um, and I am I actually fortunately am going to get to work with her a little bit more in October too. So um, for the book club. So that's like an upcoming little spoiler alert. We're definitely having her book in the book club in October. And um, and I'm super excited for that because she's an easy person to talk to. And she's so wise. Like she knows so much. And you can just, you can see it in her from the moment that like you begin interacting. But then like when she's speaking, you just want to pay yeah. attention. Like sit there and just listen and, and not interrupt or anything. And like, so... I really enjoy her for that, definitely. Okay, my, the second, my second silly question uh, is, because I always, this gave me always a lot of curiosity. Do you remember which was your first spell? Um, no, I don't. I mean, I imagine if I sat here and really thought about it, I could start talking about several different things that I tried, I mean, I'll be honest with you, when I was, you know, 18 and, and living on the streets, there were lots of moments where I was trying to, to do spells, but, um, and had other people doing spells for me, but there, there's this one spell that really stands out to me. Um, and I didn't even realize I was doing a spell and it wasn't, I wasn't working under the guise of a witch or anything, but I just, uh, using just my spit and the tobacco from cigarettes, I did this whole, I don't know, thing. Like, I couldn't really, I just put my attentions into the world with the only things I had, which was spit and tobacco and a stick. Um, I might have actually used my finger. It's very possible. But um, it was to find relief from a situation that I was in. And um this was my offering, body fluid, and the thing that was the most important to me that I could, you know, obtain, which is cigarettes. And so that actually probably um, would be the first time I did a spell and saw results from it. But like, that's in hindsight, like if I'm looking at it from 
from 2020 vision, you know, like in the background, like looking back and seeing it, that was a whole spell that I was doing there, but I didn't realize it. I wasn't like, I'm casting a spell right now. This is what I'm doing. It was just this visceral drive to do it. Um, prior to that, I mean, there's lots of different things that I was like, oh, let me, I'm going to light this candle and this is my intention and, and that's it. And I couldn't really say that any of that really stands out. The things that stand out are the ones that really work, right? So like now that I know what I'm doing and I have a firm understanding of how to use magic, when I'm doing a spell, I can see the results, you know, like I, I'm able to um, identify when results are happening or when it's, it's working, but not the way I expected or whatever, right? And I also am severely connected to my claircognizance. Um, I very, very much allow claircognizance to kind of guide me through everything. So if I receive a knowing, I'm like, okay, that's a knowing. And I don't second guess it and I go with it. And so because of this, when I'm like casting now and, and I receive a knowing, my magic becomes much more powerful when I start doing that. But then sometimes I'll do a spell, like I just did a new moon ritual and um, it was a whole three day thing. And two of my candles burned like super clean and they were great. And it was a candle each night. And then the third day, the candle was like whack. Like it just went all over the place and it, it had like mountains on either side it was just like it burned weird it didn't burn the way that these candles typically burn and so I found myself examining that and and seeking to understand what I was experiencing right and and I had this understanding this knowing that what I want is coming but not in the way I expect it and it's not going to be this easy thing there there are definitely like mountains to climb to get there or obstacles but um yeah, I mean, like, I, I definitely practice magic all the time now, so I can't really point out the first time I cast a spell, but I can say that sitting in Dallas, Texas, outside of the apartment that I did not have a key to and was only allowed to sleep at and could not have anything but Christian music in was um, a whole mood <laughs> that was definitely witchy without me knowing it while I was, like, trying to devote myself to Christ and pretend like I'm not gay anymore and that conversion therapy works so that I could stop being homeless. But um, got me out of the situation. I did go back to homeless, but I wanted out of the situation because that was miserable. So that's definitely a thing. Wow. My, my <laughs> first one was uh, obviously not so important. Uh, was a charm bag, a blue charm bag. Uh, that I do, I obsess with charms for the reason I wrote the book. Uh, that was because I, they put me, in a, uh, they moved me from the art school to the military school. That was a very big change. And I was doing terrible uh, in all the classes because there were so many classes and I not was really interested in anything. And I do a blue charm bag uh, that I find some kind of spell in, in a book on white magic. We are talking about 19th where, where the books were black magic, white magic, you know? Yeah. Like, not like now. And was a spell for going better in classes. And when I think about it, I, I remember, wow, it really works very well because most of the time I don't pay attention to the classes because I was really bored. But worked very well. Now, the, uh, with my experience, I try to see the spell and it's like, wow, where's, where's so many things grown going there? But, but obviously, go, jo, um, Joe's was deeper, was more important, was something really uh, important to do. And uh, uh, it was like, you, you, you think that it's simple, but it's a lot of symbolism there in the elements that you have in, in, in your hands. One of the things that sometimes I say to students and readers is maybe you don't have all the elements that you want to figure out some kind of spell casting that you find in a book, but if some kind of god or goddess wants something from you, they will put that in your hands because they have everything. They are gods. They mm -hmm. just want to see you really doing the effort. They will try to put everything in your hands. 
and trying to make the offering and they will compensate to compensate you for it and I expect it can be very simple and can be continue being very powerful I mean I mean in, in spiritism uh, what most of the biggest spells that we has are essentially made of glass of water doing some praise mm -hmm. and adding some spices and salt and things in there and they are and they work very well and people pay you a lot of money for this spell because they work very fast also. Bini, you also uh, hear me taking the protagonist, the, the spotlight of you. Uh, you are also collaborating with the people of which with me, that is a very big platform with raising voices everywhere. I has the opportunity to talk with Meg, uh, uh, Meg Rosenbrier, uh, author of Healing, Wish, Wish, Healing Witchcraft. Sorry for my accent. Uh, I say to her, I really love the platform. I really adore the platform because before of her, all the platform were a little more uh, centric in, in the people. Uh, in the people inside of the platform, she's trying to raise everybody there. She's trying mm -hmm. to bring everybody there. Uh, you are working there with the people of which with books. How is this experience for you? Because you are literally a new author and you are doing all of this. You are doing online events. You are, you are doing, you say it's simple. You say like, oh, you know, I'm not doing too much. I'm pretty new here. But you was in a video with Laura and Jason. And everybody knows them. You was in the level in Kong months ago. Also, you are in, the, in this platform. So you are literally rocking all of this and you are doing all of this in front of everybody and you're doing it majestically. How is this work for you? Um, it's, it's work. I mean, like, so I have a day job. I, I work from nine until six every day, um, for like a power tool company. And, um, and so I spend my day at a computer and then it'll be after work that I'm doing things like this, or I wake up early in the morning to, prepare everything for the month with the Witch With Books book club, um, or I'm reaching out to authors to get them on for the book club for upcoming months. And, um, and you know, I'm also writing another book and having a family and doing all these things. So it's, it's definitely a juggling act. And there are certainly days where I don't know how I'm pulling it off, but then there are other days where I'm like, well, I just got to sleep at these hours and wake up. And when I, I'll be honest with you, eclipse season came in and my entire schedule went bonkers. I just like everything went to shit. So I'm really kind of struggling to get back on point with everything from like my diet to my schedule for work and everything. <clears throat> and, um, when I am on my schedule, when I'm not like being this, I don't know, blow up like ah, person, um, it it's functional. I mean, I can I can pull it off, but I am I'm like a a triple fire. Like my big three are all fire signs. I'm an Aries and a Sat and a double Sag for rising and moon, and um, and my North Node is in Leo, and I just. There's so many things about how I function when I look at the astrology that I understand right now because I'm constantly learning. Actually, Meg Rosenbrier is like my private little where I learn everything from. She'll like bring something up and then I'm like researching for an hour after a conversation so I understand what she's talking about. Um, but um, that kind of like fire that go push kind of get it done carry it energy from um the tarot is or even night energy from the tarot is very much like my default kind of um position to the world like i i'm a go-getter i go out and i get what i want and it comes from living on the streets and being a hustler because like when you don't know where you're going to eat and you have to figure out how to make money you're going to do that any way you can. 
So like whether that's standing on a street corner and yelling at strangers that you'll read their tarot for, um, you know, a donation of whatever they want to give, or you're like conning some well-to-do looking person because they're in the bad neighborhood that are your stomping grounds. You know, like I didn't do the best things um, when I was trying to survive, but because I needed to survive, I did them. And now I can bring all of that into the real world that I exist in now. And that drive is still there. It's different because I want to be an honest person and I want to do the right thing and do right by people and, you know, um, build a community and make up for some of the shit that I did as a younger guy. But, um, like, it's still the same in essence as it's always been is that like, this is how I survive. I just keep moving forward. I'm like a shark. I can't stop. This is amazing. Uh, you are helping with um, Witch With Me and working, and also you are doing Witch With Books. That is very smart. It's very interesting. It's very new in this community. You are helping to bring other people together, promoting books, promoting new authors and all authors who has new books. Um, it's, it's a lot of work, and you are doing all of this in front of everybody in social media. And it's very inspiring because the same people who read your book now see you in social media doing all of these things. And yeah, we continue struggling with this because that's life. But at the same time, people see, oh, this guy, look, everything that he's doing, you, you continue inspiring. And that's, that's great. Um, I really don't have more questions for you. If it were for me, you know I am a very good stalker. I could stalk with you for other two or three hours. But I don't really have more questions. Uh, something else that you want to say, anything, something that you want to add? Uh, I mean, like, no, we, we, we touched on everything that I got going on. I mean, I'm definitely um, in the process of trying to build yet another program. I like to have a lot of plates spinning, but ultimately, I mean... I want to build up my community and help them see that if I can do it, they can do it. So I have some things in the works that um, are still in planning stages, but I'm hoping to be able to offer even more to the witchcraft community um, in the very near future. Uh, so keep an eye out. Like if, if you want to know what's happening, you're going to have to pay attention to me. So probably follow me on Instagram because that's where I, I'm not the best at Twitter. I try to be. If it weren't for Elo, I definitely like might miss most of what's happening on Twitter. But I check it and then I see, oh, I have a notification. It's because Elo, Elo like put my name on something again. I'm like, oh, hey, like, and then it like lots of notifications come through. So that's like nice, but I'm not as active as I could be on on Twitter. But that's because if I have something to say in the written word, typically it's going to end up in a book somewhere and that's when it'll get there. So like, I like to, I'm a visual storyteller also. Like I'm not just a writer. I'm, I'm a visual artist as well. Like I have a background in painting and building things, um, sets and painting and um, little weird installations. And I like to play with dead things and turn them into more interesting items um so like I try to present all of that on Instagram because I feel like even on Instagram I can also use words right if I put something on Twitter it's also going to end up on Instagram and then by default Facebook but I only really use Facebook for like actual friends and family um I try not to pull in strangers because it's Facebook like Facebook for me is the not, it's like everything is stranger danger on Facebook. On Instagram, I'm like, pay attention. We're cool. Yes. Like, this is what I can show you. But like, you know, my kids and stuff are, are part of my life on Facebook. So I don't want to pull them into, you know, everyone knowing who they are, seeing them or not that anyone's paying attention to me. But um, like, you know, Instagram is the place. So if you want to keep up, Vincent underscore Hagenbotham. I'm sure it's going to be in your show notes. You can follow me there um, and stay up to date with anything that I'm doing. 
and also go follow which with books because like i'm doing things over there um other than that be good to everybody that's all i had to say on that just be good to everybody and meet people where they're at hey yeah let's say something about this really fast i'm gonna go on a tangent i think that it's really important that somebody starts paying attention to to the fact that we need to tell people that it's okay if they're flawed and that we need to accept it if other people are flawed and stop kind of like being the chicken that's pecking at the one dark spot on the other chickens. Like we don't need to like nitpick each other. We're a whole community. And I think that what's really important in our entire community is taking the time to be a community instead of like, I don't know, polarizing everything. Just roll with it, stay in your own lane and be good to everybody. Just be good to everybody. Treat everybody with kindness and then like good things happen unless they don't because that's kind of like toxically positive, but you know. I am toxic positive, I know. Uh, are you? <laughs> I am toxic positive. Yeah, all my friends say that to me. You, you are so positive that you are a little toxic. And, and I am like, yes, and I am embracing that. Um, one of the things that I continually repeat about, about this topic that you bring, that uh, is a very serious topic, um, because I, I always try to avoid fights from very children. I am the minor. I, I has five sisters older than me, and they have a brother older than me. So uh, I am the minor, I am the youngest, and fight with these people was very complicated. So I grew up in that system, and I always try to avoid fights, especially if I am not part of the fight. Uh, something that is very important to remember, according to what you are saying, just to complement here, the community, the community will be always bigger than any problem that we have with each other. If I have a conflict with Vincent, with you, the day of tomorrow, that conflict is you and me. I don't need to bring all the community there uh, because the community will be bigger. And when you and I finally resolve our difference the day of tomorrow, the community will continue there. And when you die and I die, the, com the community will be there. So the community right. will be bigger than any other problem that we can have. I mean, right. if, if the day of tomorrow, Vincent come and say, Elohim, stop stalking me in all social media. And I say, no, I want to continue stalking you. I don't care about you. Uh, if that happens, uh, for example, uh, it's just something between you and me. Uh, the community is bigger than that. It's bigger than any fight that we can have. And it's more important focus in continue building the community because all the whole metaphysical community it's a mix up of many minorities trying to bring together something very precious, <coughs> magically, that is spiritually. And this thing that is magic and witchcraft is literally the, the embodiment that is bringing everyone together to the minority, to this group. And we are all made for minorities. So it's important trying to continue building that and focus more mm -hmm. in, the, in the build and less in destroy. Right. I mean, like, I just think like, you know, kindness gets you really far in life and meeting people where they're at also gets you far. You don't have to agree with people, but I think that something that, I mean, it's probably always happened in the community and it probably happens in every community. But I think that like this weird thing that humans do where we are like, oh, hey, like, this is my issue and I'm going to yeah. tell everybody that this is my issue. I don't, I'm not a hundred percent sure that people want to watch that happen in their community. I definitely don't. And so I just find that like, I don't know. I, I guess like if, if you're asking everybody to be kind to everybody, you're also expecting people to be very fake. So I, I it's too, I guess it's too much of an absolute to say always be kind or always be fair, but I mean, maybe just do your best. Exactly. Right? That's like, yeah. Vincent, thank you for your time. I know that you are a very busy person. You are, you are always working. Uh, you have 
you have a life that's totally different to me. I don't know what is that. Uh, you have a beautiful dog. You have children. And you are very busy working and doing a lot of stuff. So I really appreciate the time that you bring here and all the information that you're bringing here. Uh, everybody, thank you for watching the video. Uh, remember, go follow Vincent uh, in his social media. I, you will find all his links below in the description, his book, his next book coming in any moment in the next years. Um, which with me, which with books, all the links are below. Thank you, Vincent, for everything. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me. Bye, everybody.